Good afternoon, I'm Chris Rolke, president of Stetson University. We will begin this webinar in just a few moments. We are waiting for uh, our platform to populate. Uh, we have uh, over 680 people registered for this event. Uh, so I'm gonna wait till the ticker uh, gets closer to that number so that we don't leave some folks out. Good afternoon. Again, I'm Chris Rolke, Stetson University's 10th president. I also serve as a member of the faculty in education and American studies. Welcome to the Rolke's Report Live. We have a very full agenda today and an extraordinary panel of experts and caregivers and leaders uh, to speak with you here today. I'd like to ask if I could to have our agenda be placed on the screen so you can see that we are here today to provide a community COVID-19 update. We're gonna speak about vaccination requirements and accommodations. Needless to say, certainly here in Florida, around the country, in fact, around the globe, the Delta variant uh, continues to create challenges for all of us. We'll talk about that and vaccinations. We'll also talk about our fall 21 tier 2.5 uh, uh, guidelines and the kind of campus environment that we are uh, going to foster. Also talk about ongoing COVID-19 testing. We also have with us our provost and our dean at the law school to talk about fall 2021 academic planning. Many of you uh, very generously put in questions in advance. We are going to do our very best to respond to those questions. You will also have opportunities to add questions as the presenters speak. And we will leave 20 minutes or so at the end of this webinar to try to address uh, as many of your questions uh, as possible. Uh, I'm also pleased to report that we have Dr. Joseph Smith here on video. Dr. Smith has been an extraordinary resource for Stetson uh, throughout this pandemic. And I'd like to turn now, if I could, to some of his remarks. Well, hello, Stetson. I, I appreciate the opportunity to be here again today. Uh, I want to thank uh, the leadership and Mr. President. Thank you very much for uh, reaching out uh, to spread the information that we have at the hospital level to your staff and students. Uh, Stetson has been an amazing partner throughout this pandemic, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. I have a list of questions uh, that have come from uh, students and staff, and I'm prepared to answer those for you here today. So question number one is, what is the COVID-19 Delta situation in hospitals and care centers in our community. Right now, the Delta variant of the COVID-19 virus represents the overwhelming majority of cases that we are seeing in the hospital system. Uh, Delta variants, if you are unaware, is a much more aggressive strain of the COVID virus than we have seen in the past. Uh, the Delta variant is producing a much more critical illness, a more respiratory illness, uh, in young adults. In fact, if I look at uh, the patients who are hospitalized uh, in, our, in our system, not just infected, but hospitalized, sick enough to be uh, admitted to the hospital, even under these circumstances, the distribution among the age groups is roughly even between ages 18 and 64. Now, that's a big difference from what we saw before. So the situation I'm seeing is young people, just like you and me, uh, who have been infected with this virus, who are so sick that they are ending up not only in the hospital, but in the ICU, on breathing machines, and even on heart-lung bypass. Unfortunately, we're even seeing people of your age group who do not survive this. So the situation right now is that we are at absolutely the limit uh, of what we're able to do. We're having to stop uh, providing some of the surgical care that we would normally provide. Uh, illnesses like cancer surgeries are actually being delayed a few weeks uh, so that we can care for the acutely ill because our operating room staff are deployed taking care of COVID patients elsewhere in the hospital. Again, I wanna thank Dr. Smith for always being uh, at the ready for Stetson University. That collaboration has been significant throughout. As you can tell, he's painting a, a, a difficult picture uh, for our local area hospital systems, and it is our responsibility uh, as Stetson University uh, community members and members of the broader Deland 
and Volusia County community, as well as the community in Gulfport, where our College of Law is, that we do our part. And I'd like to take us back, if I could, uh, a year ago, roughly, actually a year and a half ago, uh, the first COVID-19 case was reported in the United States on January 21st, 2020. And in July of 2020, Florida was at the epicenter of the pandemic in the United States. And Stetson worked diligently to anticipate budget shortfalls, to promote health and safety on our campuses. In fact, uh, the budget we projected for 2021 was $17 million less than was anticipated because of enrollment shortfalls related to COVID. That required a lot of community sacrifice and care. And what we decided as a community that we were gonna be laser focused on keeping our academic and residential communities safe in order to enable a Stetson education to move forward. I'm also so pleased as your president that this community, both here in Deland and in Gulfport, embraced three critical themes as we traversed the 2021 academic year. And those themes were kindness, empathy, and shared ownership. Those are precisely the three themes that we are gonna to continue to abide by as we move forward in the 21-22 academic year. It was through extraordinary collaboration and sacrifice and rooted in love and care for our community that Stetson was highly successful in 2021 in keeping our community safe and moving a Stetson education forward. And again, that is precisely what we're going to do to promote health and safety and a Stetson education for our students in 21-22. It was because of that love and care for one another and that collective sacrifice that Stetson never closed we did not lay off a single Stetson employee and our students, very importantly, made powerful and important progress toward their degrees. Education is an essential service and we have and will continue to demonstrate this essentiality. Because we have been steadfast in our commitment to the extent possible of following CDC and American College Health Association guidelines and out of profound respect for both scientific evidence and public health priorities that I am announcing today that Stetson University will be joining thousands of employers around the country, including our higher education peers right here in Florida, such as the University of Miami, Nova Southeastern University, Johnson and Wales, Jackson University and Rollins College in requiring the vaccine for full-time employees of Stetson University. This decision I can assure you is rooted in kindness, in empathy and in shared ownership of our collective well being. I need to thank all the members of the Stetson University community, faculty, staff, students, Board of Trustees, and our public health partners for fully supporting Stetson as we deploy this safe and highly effective mitigant on our campuses. What did we do in 2021? We deployed all the very best mitigants we had at our disposal. You remember the four W's we washed our hands, we wore our masks. We watched our distance and we watched our crowd size. We did those things because those were the best mitigants available to us at that time and they were successful. Well, now due to the extraordinary advances in science, we have a very powerful mitigant to help the transmission of this disease, help mitigate the transmission of this disease. And that is one of the three vaccines made by Pfizer, made by Moderna and made by Johnson & Johnson. I'd like to turn now, if I could, to my wonderful colleague, Drew McCann, who will share with you additional details on the rollout of this requirement. Thank you, Drew. Sure, thanks, President Rolke. Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to talk through the process of the vaccines with you. A follow-up communication will be sent out shortly, reviewing some of this information and also providing greater detail. First, as President Rolke just said, full-time employees um, must receive the full vaccination series and uh, the timeline is that must receive the series and report it by Thursday, September 30th. So what this means is that you must have completed the second dose of a two dose series, that's the Moderna or the Pfizer, um, or receive the single Johnson and Johnson dose. Um, do keep in mind, uh, in case you're not aware, that the two vaccines, Moderna and Pfizer, 
require waiting periods before the first and second shot. So you want to uh, keep track of that and not leave the second shot to the last minute. Um, we'll provide some specific dates in the FAQ, um, but you will want to monitor that timing. Uh, once receiving the full series by September 30th, you'll need to report the vaccine through our online reporting tool. Uh, that link has been sent out many times and it'll also be included in the uh, communications following this meeting. We are aware that some of you are concerned about um, reporting through the online system and that's okay. We've got a, got a process for that. Um, all you need to do is contact the HR director on your campus. So that's Betty Whiteman in DeLand or Pam Skolorakis at the College of Law to set up an in-person or Teams meeting where you can show them their card and they can document your compliance. Uh, there are a number of options as to where to get the vaccine. There are a number of on-campus clinics scheduled, and you can find that information on the Safer Stetson site. There's also a slide at the end of this presentation uh, telling you the dates of those on-campus clinics. Also, um, if you prefer, you can also get the vaccine at an off-campus location. And there is a lot of information about those off-campus sites on the Safer Stetson website um, under the COVID-19 vaccinations tab. We are providing up to four hours of paid release time if you choose to get the vaccine at an off-campus location during work hours. Of course, you'll need to work with your supervisor in order to schedule that time. Um, last thing I want to talk about is that there is an exception process to assist any employee who has an underlying medical condition or disability that would be negatively affected by the vaccine, a pregnancy or pregnancy-related medical condition, or an objection based on a sincerely held religious belief, practice, or observance. If this is the case for you, you will complete the vaccine exemption request form and upload official documentation from your medical provider or religious leader. Specific information about the documentation required and the link to the form will be sent out shortly. Um, I should note that if you are granted an exception, then you will need to submit to regular COVID testing and also adhere to other preventative protocol. Uh, one final word at this point, uh, an incentive that we had provided to staff as they completed their excuse me, vaccinations uh, is an additional paid day off. And we will continue to do that to provide that additional paid day off as people report their status because we really appreciate and in fact rely on everybody's contribution to keeping our campus safe. I'll stop there. I'm sure there will be follow-up questions, um, but thank you for all that you do for our community. Drew McCann, right back at you. Thank you for the clarity of that information and also that all that you and your colleagues and human resources do to promote the wellness of the people that work at Stetson. So thank you uh, for that. I'd like to welcome now to the screen, uh, Professor Estelle Johnson and Johanna Burgos. They will be discussing Delta information, including transmission rates, viral loads, breakthroughs, and vaccinations. Thank you both for joining us today. Thank you, President Rocky. Um, as President Rocky said, I'm Joanna, your Director of Stetson Health Service, and I want to share with you um, some statistics on our current campus cases. We currently have 37 individuals on isolation, uh, but seven of them are international students who we isolated uh, following CDC guidelines. So we have 35 in the land and two at the College of Law in Gulfport. We also have uh, currently a total of 17 positive cases. You can also find this information on our public um, dashboard under Safer Stats on uh, webpage. And two of the positive cases are fully vaccinated. So we are seeing some breakthrough infections um, in the community, but they are, the number is minimum as of right now. Um, as you know, the Delta variant is very transmissible. That's why it's imperative that we continue to wear masks inside, um, outside when not when in, you know, in close proximity, outside in the community, um, shopping centers, things like that, um, and also get vaccinated. Um, our vaccination rates right now overall for the land, and when we say overall, we're talking about students and employees, um, including obviously faculty and staff, it's 56% and College of Law 63%. So we are seeing those numbers rise, um, but we are mainly concerned right now because of the breakthrough infections. Um, Stetson works in very close collaboration with the Department of Health of Volusia County, Pinellas County, and Hillsborough County. And um, it is very important 
that you report any COVID case to uh, the university, we do have a link that we have been using, um, Stetson reported that edu and any exposure to a positive case any uh, positive case yourself any positive case in the on-campus community and off campus please report it to the university that way we can go ahead and start contact tracing and do some follow-up on that even if you're fully vaccinated so if you are having any symptoms related to covid and you're fully vaccinated please report it and then we will provide additional guidance also, um, Stetson has a very solid contact tracing system, but this system only works uh, with the help of the community. So we really ask you that you report it and that you are transparent on the contact tracing call. Um, we have a team of contact tracers and you also may receive a call from the health department. Um, Dr. Johnson has developed a very good system with Stetson University and that way students um, and our community members do not get many multiple calls but it's imperative that you reply to our messages and that you answer our phone calls for um for effective tracing i want to turn over to dr johnson thank you so much johanna uh, i am dr sl johnson i teach uh, epidemiology and also teach um so many other public health classes so I would like to talk a little bit about uh, the situation uh, in our state and in our county. As many of you know, many um, perhaps you're following up um, the cases in Florida. Florida has uh, is breaking its records day after the day. Um, I actually looked up the last report that they, are, that they do now. There, there are weekly reports for Florida. Their uh, last reported weekly report reported that Florida had more than 130,000 cases, uh, infections. That is the positivity uh, rate of 18.9%. Well, uh, and unfortunately during that week, 175 people uh, passed away due to COVID-19. Here in, uh, in uh, Volusia County, during that week, we had more than 3,000, 3,200 infections, which actually is the uh, positivity uh, rate of a little bit over 19 something percent. So the positivity rate in Volusia County is a little bit higher than uh, Florida, the, uh, the state of Florida, I mean. And the other thing I wanted to let you know is that if you look at the group ages, right, with my age groups, the highest positivity rate is among those individuals who are 12 to 19, they, their positivity rate is 24%, and uh, only 41% of this group are vaccinated. The, um, the second highest positivity rate in Florida is among individual, many of our students age group, individuals in their 20s, 20 to 29, which is 22.6% right now, and uh, the, with the vaccination rate of 43%. So um, the other thing I wanted to um, let you know, of course, there was some link between vaccination and positivity rate. Uh, one of the reasons that the Delta variant is um, hitting um, these groups, the younger groups, um, much more aggressively is that because obviously we have a, we have lower uh, vaccination rate uh, in these in these age groups. So and now uh, what we know about vaccines is that first of all, vaccines are highly effective. That's number one. Number two is uh, that even if you end up getting infection after vaccine, uh, vaccination, you are way less likely, like uh, much less likely to end up in the hospital. So uh, why that's important? Maybe, maybe last year for your age group, it wasn't very important. Uh, you thought that, you know, like younger people don't get severely ill. So that age advantage is fading. And you heard it in Dr. Uh, Smith's video, that age advantage is fading. He was saying that in the hospital, they're, see they're seeing a lot much younger people. So, and there is an explanation for that. The virus is finding the victims wherever it can. And unfortunately, it's finding now it's victims about unvaccinated. Last year, the highest um, risk groups were people who were older, and as you were, you became older, you had higher risk. This year, it's 
is really more about vaccinated and unvaccinated. So unvaccinated people are at higher risk of infection, hospitalization, and even more severe outcomes. So I am going to ask you to please consider getting vaccinated as soon as possible. That would, you would do a big favor to yourself, but you also save lives around yourselves. Even if you do not get severely ill, Delta variant is uh, aggressive, it's killing people. You just heard what um, Dr. Smith was saying at hospitals at uh, lim their limits. And one thing I was pointing out somewhere else that remember, when we have more and more and more hospitalizations due to COVID-19, we will have less staff in hospitals to take care of other very urgent issues. If we have loved ones who maybe have a heart attack, if we have loved ones who have a car accident or some trauma, they are less likely to receive the attention because of the staffing issues right now in our hospital system. So so what is happening as we get more and more hospitalization due to COVID-19, we're also more likely to see um, like bad, severe outcomes due to other illnesses and other diseases because everything is linked together uh, to one another. So um, if I do have time, I would like to explain a little bit about, about Delta variant. I'm not sure how well I am doing uh, on my time. I can stop here and, and just take questions. Uh, at the, at, towards the end. Professor Johnson and Joanna, thank you so very much. I do think we're going to try to move on to our next panelists, uh, but we will make sure that we leave time at the end for your additional discussion around the Delta variant. I also want to echo what was just described, which is this really is about the collective well being of not only our Stetson University community, but the broader Deland and Gulfport communities as well. So uh, I thank you both for your expertise and your commitment to keeping our community healthy, well and collaborating, so I appreciate it. I'd like to turn now, if I could, to Lynn Schoenberg and Terry Rodwin. They have been absolutely extraordinary stewards of the Safer Stetson Task Force. That has been a real sincere and in-depth collaboration over the last year and a half, and I can't thank them enough for their service to our community, as well as all the other Safer Stetson Task Force members. Thank you both. Thank you, President Rolke. So I'm going to start with a discussion about tier 2.5. As you probably know already, we have moved to tier 2.5. And, and if you're ever curious as to what tier we're in, the Safer Stetson webpage always indicates the tier. And you can go to that Safer Stetson webpage. It's right there on the front what tier we are in. We believe strongly in the mitigation measures that are in tier 2.5 as we start the school year and work to keep our campuses safer uh, during the pandemic. But I do want you to keep in mind that that tier will adjust um, or might adjust throughout the semester and throughout the year as we see various things. How does the Delta variant progress? How is the community transmission rates outside of the Stetson community? And what are our vaccination rates? Those will all be considered as we think about whether we can move uh, between the various tiers uh, at, during the course of the school year. I do wanna cover a few things that are unique to tier 2.5, but before we do that, I want to reinforce the face covering requirements that actually have always been in place. As you know, we have a face covering requirement on all of our campuses, and that requirement is that everyone, vaccinated or unvaccinated, wear face coverings in all indoor areas. The only exceptions to that are individually occupied offices and in your residence hall, as long as there's no guest in either your office or your residence hall. And again, that applies whether you're vaccinated or unvaccinated. And as a reminder, our face covering requirement requires that uh, you have a, a well-fitting face covering that covers both your nose and mouth and does not permit bandanas or neck gaiters um, or face shields alone. The face shield can be used in conjunction with a traditional face mask. So uh, if you have any questions about that, the Safer Stetson webpage has all of that information for you again. So a couple of things about tier 2.5 that I want to highlight before my, my colleague uh, discusses some of the other aspects of our mitigation measures. The first of those is some of the residential uh, restrictions in 2.5, and this primarily applies to our DeLand campus. The, the uh, first is that you are not permitted to have any non-Stetson guests in your residence halls. 
Um, so that means friends from high school can't uh, come to visit at this point. We, we are keeping it to our own Stetson community. And you are limited to just one guest per room while we are in tier 2.5. In addition, there are spaces in the various residence halls, and this is true on, on all campuses, where there are occupancy limits. Those differ based on the size of the space, so keep an eye out for the signage in those rooms. That's things like kitchens and laundry facilities. Make sure that you are complying with the occupancy limits and, of course, uh, physically distancing within those spaces. In addition, I know that a lot of you will be interested to know what is going on with the libraries. The libraries are open. But as with uh, the, the residence halls, there may be occupancy limits in some spaces, especially in the smaller uh, study rooms or uh, other carol spaces that are, are smaller. And please note that if you are at the College of Law, we do have a reservation system for those study spaces. And so you will have to actually reserve uh, your spaces. There are some other components of Tier 2.5. I'm not going to cover everything today, but I would encourage you to keep an eye on the Safer Stetson webpage where there is more detail about Tier 2.5 as well as the dashboard to provide information about where we stand as a community. And with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Lynn. Thank you so much, Terry, and hello, Hatters out there. I'm going to talk a about a few other elements about what's currently happening for us right now on campus. So gateway testing is off on both campuses. It's going really well. And so if you haven't gone through your gateway clearance or gateway testing process yet, uh, please make sure you're all set up and ready to do that. In the College of Law, you'll need to get your wristband if you're vaccinated, and you can do that at Human Resources or at Student Life. If you're over here in the land, then a reminder that all students must go through a gateway clearance process but if you're vaccinated, you won't get tested. You'll get your wristband. If you're also moving into your residence hall, we'll get you your key, all that stuff that you need. Um, and so you must sign up for an appointment to be able to do that. And we are gonna wear our bracelets in the land till August 29th. And over at the College of Law, the bracelets will be worn till September 2nd. We're on slightly different schedules there. For Deland, for employees, you do not need to make an appointment. For Gateway, you can just walk into the Holla Center and they'll take care of you. Testing is gonna keep happening throughout the semester as it did all of last year. And we will still be testing some of our high contact, high risk groups, including all of our student athletes on a routine basis. Uh, but testing is also open to everyone else. So if you would like to optionally get tested, whether you're vaccinated or not, that is open to you. We've talked about the fact that we're gonna be having some vaccination clinics. And so we wanted to give a little bit more information about that now. Um, and then there's much more information on the website. So the College of Law, their first vaccination clinic is August 12th. And they have the Pfizer vaccine for that event. There's actually some follow-up events throughout the semester as well. So not just that one. And then in Deland, our first event will be on August 18th. So actually the day before classes even start, and we're going to have the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine here in Deland. We were actually hoping to have the J&J, &J, and some of our early announcements indicated that, but there's a current shortage on the J&J &J vaccine um, actually nationwide, and so our wonderful part partners of the Department of Health won't be able to provide that to us at this time. And then my last comment is just to share some exciting things that are happening, because as we're talking about trying to stay safe, we also wanna talk about the wonderful engagement and vibrancy that makes Stetson uh, who we are, right? And so at the College of Law, we're welcoming 250 first year law students through their orientation process that's ongoing right now. Welcome, new hatters. And, and thank you to our wonderful faculty and staff that are making that happen, including Terry right here. And over in Deland, September 1st is our engagement fair. And I really wanna highlight this for all of our students. If you've been virtual for an entire year and you're back on campus, this is a chance to connect with a student organization, a club sport that maybe you haven't had a chance to connect with while you were gone or even before. But for first year students, we absolutely, absolutely wanna see you there. And you can get more information on that on our Engage platform, which students can always access through their My Stetson. Also a cool welcome back bash on August 23rd, uh, physically distant, lots of mitigants in place, but it's happening, sponsored by Student Government Association and Hatter Productions. 
So welcome back everyone. I'm hoping that we can make this as good of a year together as we can. Go Hatters. Terry and Lynn, thank you so much and we will. Uh, much like we did last year, we are going to be a resilient and tenacious community that's gonna care for one another and we will in fact succeed. I would like to spend just a few moments, if I may, before I turn to our academic side of the house, uh, to talk a little bit about costs associated with COVID-19 mitigation. Uh, because Stetson is such a caring community and because we prioritize health and safety, I'd like to throw out a number to you of the uh, costs associated with COVID mitigation for 2021, as well as projected costs moving forward. Stetson invested $4.3 million in COVID mitigation uh, investments in 2021. What was that for? Well, we provided equipment for virtual education. We bolstered our efforts with HVAC and air purification. We had to do some renovations for social distancing. Of course, the testing protocols, both for gateway and for surveillance. We pitched some tents on campus uh, to enable people to congregate outside. We had additional cleaning and sanitation protocols, many of these things still in place, of course. And of course, there are costs associated with quarantining and isolation, as well as other miscellaneous and other supplies, and all in an effort to promote health and safety in our community. That's $4.3 million, and our projected costs for testing in this academic year is roughly $2,000 a student, and the cost of isolating a student, including off-campus space and staffing, is about $1,500 a student. These are real dollars. These are real dollars and also point to the need for us to work together to mitigate the transmission of this virus and the very best way we can do that. And I'm reaffirming the statement that I made on July 15th that it is my expectation as president that those that are able to get a vaccine will do so. Thank you very, very much for that. And I appreciate your opportunity here to share with you some of the real costs associated with this COVID-19 pandemic and Stetson, of course, is not alone in incurring some of these costs. I'd like to turn now, if I could, to the academic side of the house, uh, to uh, Provost Noel Painter, Executive Vice President Provost Noel Painter, as well as our Dean of the Law School, uh, Michelle Alexandre. Thank you, Noel. Thank you, Chris. And uh, hello, Michelle. Hello, Hi. 600 participants on this call. I can tell you that I knew those numbers that President Rolke was talking about just now, and I'm still stunned to hear them said out loud. The uh, mitigation efforts, the effort to keep our, communi our community as safe as possible is an expensive venture. And the day in which we can turn those dollars back to ones that are fully focused on education will be a great day for Stetson and the country. Indeed, I think uh, Dean Alexandre and I share the same sentiment in being extraordinarily proud of our faculty for the way in which they have led our students and learning throughout this pandemic. And I think we're also extraordinarily proud of our students who have shown such resilience in the way that they learn and the way that they create their own community. Um, it's just been an impressive, an impressive venture for us all. And in ways we're the same and in ways we're new right now. So that's part of what Dean Alexandre and I are gonna focus on. I will reiterate that uh, as part of an academic community, on behalf of Dean Alexandre, all of the academic deans and academic leadership, we do expect our academic community to be vaccinated. Uh, we expect our students, we expect our part-time faculty, and we expect our full-time faculty, as well as our staff, to be vaccinated. Uh, the university is putting a requirement in place for full-time faculty that takes effect uh, right away with a deadline at the end of September. And we have a requirement that's in place for our part-time employees, including our part-time faculty, our adjunct faculty, that moves into place in the new year, in the spring semester. So we can talk in more detail about that, but this is for the entire community. Why do we not require it for students? Because Florida law prohibits us from requiring it for students, but we, we feel like it is a, an important expectation to iterate that everyone is safer if they are vaccinated. We've been planning for quite some time for this to be a, a wonderful re-beginning of uh, academic inter enterprise in person uh, at Stetson this fall semester. And that planning has taken advantage of some things that we've learned and some things that we've put into place 
Uh, I want to remind us that over the last year, we've installed facilities, equipment uh, that purifies our air uh, throughout our residence halls and in all of our classrooms. We've put special cleaning in place and we've bought equipment that helps us to clean our facilities, including our classrooms. We continue to have a mask requirement because we know that masks are effective in preventing the spread of this virus. And those things coming together, together re have resulted in a situation where at Stetson, nor at, at any other international college and universities in Florida school, have we documented a case of the spread of the virus inside the classroom. There's been no documented case of the spread of the virus inside the classroom at Stetson or any other ICUF school. That's because of the mitigants that we put in place, the mitigants that will still be in place at Stetson moving forward into the next semester. We are committed to the experience that we have promised our students, which is largely in person. Roughly 95% of our classes are in person going into the fall semester and we are firmly headed in that direction. Classes start on Monday at the College of Law. Our first year seminar classes start on Monday on the DeLand campus. Other classes for undergraduates on Thursday, next week on the DeLand campus, and soon to come for various other graduate programs that emanate from the DeLand campus. And the modality for those courses is the same as is listed on the course schedule, the, the various course schedules we have out there. Uh, the, we do have an accommodations process that we've had in place for quite some time. For faculty who have, have medical accommodations, you can submit your information through HR just like you've been able to for the last six months for accommodations for your classes. I can say that we are expanding uh, the accommodation process to include family members who live at home who are immunocompromised. Faculty, if you have a family member who lives at home with you, and is immunocompromised, you can submit documentation through HR for temporary accommodation. And that accommodation process uh, hopefully will be swift for us and is approval to shift modality, certainly in coordination with the dean of your area uh, through September the 3rd. So there's a definitive date. At the end of the day though, we recognize that we've made a promise and we'd like to deliver on that promise to the students and to the experience for Stetson that we believe is essential uh, to what we expect the outcomes for our students to be. Dean Alexandre. Thank you, everyone. I'd like to reiterate my thanks to all of you, particularly to Gulfport and Tampa for keeping us safe. We uh, were able to mitigate to um, very low transmission all year because of your hard work. And we will continue to do that. We urge you to take seriously the mandate that has been put in place. Uh, without you, we won't be able to get back to normal. So as a reminder for the College of Law on both campuses, classes are in person. Um, starting Monday, yay! And that means that um, we only have a handful of electives. Exams also are expected to be in person. Even if you have a, a rare class that's remote, your exam may be in person. Uh, the normal attendance policy, which allows to requires 80% attendance and allows for rare exceptions, is, will, is in place. That means you, if you have any questions, you have to work with our associate dean for academic affairs, we will make accommodations for isolation, et cetera. But you must talk to us. Uh, our classes will be recorded, but that does not mean that you can avail yourself of that option. You, you, you must follow the professor's policy and work with our associate dean. I want to remind us at the College of Law that we are doing extremely well, and I want to continue, I hope, that trajectory. Our full-time faculty, you are vaccinated at 85%. Our 1L students, you are leading the charge at 72% vaccination among students. And our wonderful staff, you are vaccinated at 76.4%. We can bring this home, everybody. So um, thank you, thank you, thank you. As a reminder, our library new hours will be um, until 10 p.m. in Gulfport. Um, and 10 p.m. in Tampa. And on weekends in Tampa, on. Um, in um, Gulfport, we will have until 6 p.m. in Gulfport and 10 p.m. in Tampa. We have vaccination events also on September 9th 
and September 30th. Um, and do mark those dates as they are opportunity that the university has provided for everyone to have a chance to get vaccinated. Uh, I want to remind our students about the webinar for students where we can answer more questions in more detail on Friday. Please come, we, we can parcel all of that out and answer all questions you have. And lastly, gateway testing, as Lynn mentioned, is ongoing August 13th, August 16th, August 17th, August 18th, you will have opportunity to test. So don't forget faculty, staff or students, you know, you know how we do, you show up, we accommodate you. I so enjoy the privilege of working with you. We will have an amazing year. Dr. Painter and Dr. Uh, I should say, uh, Dean Alexandre, although you are a, you are a Juris doctor. I'm a Jewish doctor, we claim it. <laughs> it takes a while to get that degree. <laughs> uh, I, I just love, I love the enthusiasm and the confidence that you bring to our community, both of you. Uh, we are doing smart and judicious things to move a Stetson education forward on the land campus and at the College of Law. And that is because education is essential. So I thank you both very, very much. We now like to have the screen populated again from our expert panelists. This is a Q&A portion of our webinar today. And before we get into those questions, let me remind you that we are unlikely to get to all of your questions that were submitted. So many wonderful questions have been submitted, both in advance and in real time. We will do our best to hit some of the high points. There will be an FAQ and a follow-up communication to the entire community shortly after this webinar. And I also want to point out that we will continue to do these kinds of webinars, as well as our weekly updates as we did last year on the COVID-19 context. The community very much valued those up to updates and we will continue to do them. Um, in a time like these, you cannot have a situation where you over communicate and we are committed to doing that kind of level of communication with all of you. And again, I want to thank you for joining us today. I'd like to turn if I could first to Drew McCann. There were a number of HR related questions that came in both in advance and also during in real time. Drew, can I turn the screen over to you to respond to some of those questions? Sure, absolutely. Um, so there is a question about whether we're going to bring back COVID leave and the uh, concern that for those with kids who can't get vaccinated and going back to school that may find uh, a pretty difficult situation. Uh, at this point, we are not bringing back the COVID leave, but we are monitoring. Uh, we're aware of the concern and we're going to keep an eye on on that situation. Um, there are a couple of questions about um, some confusion about what we meant when we said employees and I think we've cleared that up, but doesn't hurt to say it one more time that um, all full time employees, faculty and staff are guided by this mandate. Um, adjunct professors, part time employees, volunteers, uh, they will fall under this uh, for the spring term. A uh, question about the the day off. If somebody has previously reported their vaccination being completed, will they still get the day off? Yes, actually, if you've already reported your vaccination, you have already received the day off. Maybe you just don't know it, but but you did. We uh we've been applying that as people do the reporting. Um talk about uh, question about student employees and if they are subject to the mandatory vaccination mandate and the answer to that is no our student employees their um, primary relationship with the university is as a student and so uh, as such they cannot fall under the mandate uh, and then question about will faculty and staff need bracelets too during the gateway te testing process and uh, yes that is the case and i think i heard correctly that college of law uh, if you've been vaccinated to get your bracelet you go to hr uh, here on the DeLand campus, you'll go uh, to the, the testing site and we'll uh, get you set up with your uh, bracelets if you're vaccinated or uh, do the gateway testing for you. And again, faculty and staff do not need uh, appointments on the DeLand campus. Drew, thank you so very much. And let me uh, also uh, reemphasize something that I said earlier and also was reinforced by Dr. Painter. And that is, I remind you that I did expect and we all expect, as we announced on July 15th, that regardless of one's status on campus, whether they be student employees, students, staff, faculty, we do expect that our community will get the vaccine. So I think that's important that we continue to make that message clear. And why do we say that? I turn to the expert, Asal Johnson, 
to talk to us about why the vaccine is so vitally important, even in the context of breakthrough infections with this Delta variant. Thank you, Professor Johnson. Thank you. Well, um, about when it comes uh, uh, to breakthroughs, let me tell you what actually it means. It means uh, breakthroughs are cases that test positive after being fully vaccinated. It does not necessarily mean people uh, actually are uh, falling ill or you know, sick. That as long as uh, they um, test positive after being fully vaccinated, then we will count them or define them as breakthroughs. The other thing I wanted to, um, to mention, and actually there has been a lengthy, I, I wrote a lengthy um, article in the Beacon for the community to understand that they should not be distracted by what they hear from breakthroughs. So that does not mean vaccine is not working. At, that's, that's not what it's, it's actually uh, saying. Vaccine is uh, now the more uh, new studies are coming, even in those who we consider breakthroughs, vaccines are working. How is that? The new studies are actually showing that, first of all, there are a, a good uh, proportion of people who, do, who are vaccinated, they come exposed to the virus and, and the vaccine prevents the disease in them. I'm talking just about breakthroughs right now. So these, so you are fully vaccinated and let's say uh, uh, you're fully vaccinated and then you uh, test positive. So what they, in the studies they found, uh, the breakthroughs compared to um, unvaccinated people with Delta variant. So in, initially, this is just true about Delta variant, not about the other types of the previous strains. With the Delta strain, initially, both vaccinated and uh, unvaccinated people have very high load of virus in their body. So what that means is that uh, they get infected and they will be this, you know, there is not much significant difference between the viral load in a vaccinated person and a breakthrough person. But what happens with, uh, with a vaccinated person is that it, it, um, the, the viral load goes down much quicker in their body than it goes in the body. The body of unvaccinated will just go through its natural life. The virus will just go through the natural life. And unfortunately, it keeps uh, multiplying in the body and sometimes it impacts the lungs. And that, that is why, that explains why even breakthrough cases have such a low, uh, very, very low rate of hospitalization and severe disease, a lot of them, are asymptomatic, they wouldn't even know they have it, or even if they have that mild symptoms. So, and if you hear in the news about breakthroughs that are in the hospital, these are usually the elderly or people with serious underlying conditions. And that is why it's so important. And, and, and one of the reasons we hear so much about breakthroughs and we have them is that a lot of people are not vaccinated yet. If we had a very high rate of vaccination, we would not. Those who would have become breakthroughs would get protections from non-breakthrough vaccinated people around them. And also those elderly people, one of them we heard in the news journal yesterday passed away, they would, get, they would receive protection from people around them. So this is, this is really important. The thing about Delta variant that I want everyone knows, with the very original strain of this virus, one person, if it, it entered a totally susceptible population, could infect between two to three other people. With Delta, one infected person can infect, again, in a totally susceptible unvaccinated population, can infect six to seven other people. So it is much, much more contagious, and that is why it's going, um, it's hitting the unvaccinated so hard, because it's actually moving fast among them. And the other thing is that you, we are giving opportunity to this virus to change. So I do not know how, how long we're going to have the advantage of vaccine pretty, actually working pretty well. We want to take away the opportunity from the virus to change to even something more, uh, you know, uh, more virulent. If if I uh, pronounce it like uh, with my accent, right, more virulent or more vicious. So please, let's just do this. Let's do this and get vaccinated because the more community level vaccinations means the more protection for everyone, including those who cannot get the vaccines, including children.
Thank you. Professor Johnson, thank you so very much for that clear explanation of why it's so vital. I'd like to carry up on that theme if I could, because at the last webinar, I made the claim and I made a simple equation, which was that vaccinations equals campus vibrancy. <laughs> it's a very simple Rolke uh, equation, but I wanted to turn to Lynn Schoenberg and uh, to, to affirm the importance of that equation uh, and the kind of steps that we can take uh, should we get a much greater percentage of our community vaccinated. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more that vaccination equals campus vibrancy and, and equals the level of engagement in person that we know you all want to have, that we want to have with all of you. And so increasing our vaccination numbers will mean that if the community transmission is under control, which it will be more under control, right, if we have more vaccinated folks, that we will be able to expand in person gatherings and in groups, increase the number of people that can gather together closer to the kinds of numbers that our amazing student organizations see at events, right? Um, here in Deland, thinking about poetry at Uncouth Hour, you know, we easily get 150 students at that event on a weekly basis, right? Um, and there's many other examples of really great programs where we would be able to expand the number of people we could have together, um, including things like recruitment, Greek recruitment, right, homecomings around the bend, um, uh, programmatic experiences in the residence halls, more spectators at athletic games, but I could just keep going on and on on the list of things um, that this could help us do and and really all comes back to the theme of community right those things are fun and fun is great. But the part that I feel like we all want um, is that in person community engagement. Um, and so I want to also just highlight that our dashboard on our sets and website has lots of data, so if you're looking to pierce out some of the data we've talked about definitely hit that dashboard up on a regular basis so you can see where we are you can toggle it between campuses students and employees and a quick um, correction is something that was said that we got some questions about in deland if you're an employee staff or faculty you do not need a gateway bracelet students in deland need a gateway bracelet and over at the college of law everyone has a gateway bracelet so i hope that helps Thank you, Lynn. And before you depart the screen, yes. um, I, I, I did want to ask you another question about our protocols. And it, it's rooted in a question that came in, which was, so a student arrives on campus, whether it be a new student or returning student, and in the gateway testing, they test positive, right? What happens from there? Yes, and I, I did see this question. And the question was in regards to the fact that results come back in 24 to 48 hours. And that's because we are using the PCR, the highest standard of tests at testing. And so it's not a rapid test, but it's a better test. And so uh, we have been getting those results back very fast. In fact, our current um, positivity rate from Gateway is 3.6%, um, which really considering everything that we've talked about um, is pretty good. We're, we're very happy with that. I wish it was zero. Um, don't you know mishear me, but um, that is a really, really great number. Um, and so uh, students are asked to be cautious until they get their Gateway results. Um, and we have actually been able to intentionally plan some student leadership programs so that the students arrive and there's enough time before they start meeting and engaging in person for their results to come in. We've made some adjustments to the focus schedule in, in terms of um, virtual engagement for the first events before we have those results in. Um, and so if we do find that someone is positive, our on-call team and our tracing team, they're notified immediately and that individual is called, even if it's after hours, which happens. Um, and then our on-call team, if it's a residential student or any student, helps to talk through isolation steps for that individual. And our tracing team follows up within uh, 48 hour business hours, but they're, they're faster than that. They're so great. Joanna talked about that earlier to do a formal tracing process with them. So we have a lot of steps in place to get people into isolation and quarantine fast. That's our goal. We know how important that is. And then we have all of these systems in place to communicate with all of you. So faculty, you get notification of your students who need to isolate or quarantine. You get notification if there's a positive in your classroom. Student employment supervisors are notified. Um, and we also have ways to notify organizational advisors as well. 
Lynn, thank you so very much. And I was listening very carefully. And what it reminded me of, of course, is what we already know, which is that we learned a tremendous amount um, uh, in the 2021 academic year in terms of protocols and being able to promote safety when we do have transmission of the virus. And so, again, I, I think your comments were very reaffirming, and I thank you for that. I'd like to turn, uh, if I could now, to the academic side. First, uh, Dr. Painter, to you, and then the, the same question to you, Dean Alexandre, which is tell us a little bit more about uh, how we're managing uh, larger uh, classes um, uh, at, on, on both the College of Law campus and in the land campus, in particular, things that might be uh, considered a little bit higher risk, like music ensembles and the like. Yeah, very good. Uh, one of the good things uh, about Stetson is we are small enough to have individual conversations about areas in which there are concern, exactly like what you just said. On the Deland campus, th there simply aren't that many of the of the very large classes, and at Stetson period, there are none like you associate uh, with large state schools, certainly at all. Part of the hard work of this summer has been to identify spaces around campus that are larger and can, can um, accommodate higher capacity classes at the spacing that we have in place for the fall semester. And let me remind you that the spacing we have for, small sem for fall semester is not the same spacing we had in fall 2019. We're not back together in, that close in those close quarters without any spacing at all. So uh, it's, it's, it's just not gonna look exactly the same. And we've, uh, we've redoubled our attention for those largest classes like ensembles in the school of music, there's one particularly large class that we're addressing specifically. Um, and so for, for ensembles, uh, for example, our ensemble directors met with the Dean just today and they've been having conversations leading up to today about how we can uh, continue to have ensemble rehearsals for our lodge ensembles like choir, orchestra and band in person, what it looks like to have a special mask that have slits in them, what it looks like to supply all the students um, who have brass instruments with bell covers or woodwind instruments with the appropriate, with the appropriate uh, mitigant uh, that is sort of like a mask. Um, to, and this is some work that we did in the spring as well. So we're continuing a lot of those things into the fall that are going to allow us to have indoor rehearsals for those large ensembles. Certainly a number of the larger classes are those that are offered at the College of Law. Michelle, what would you say about that? Thank you, and, and very simply, the individual dialogue has been very rewarding for us. As you know, we had the situation last year even more dire. So we are using the Great Hall um, for our large classes and we are distancing as well. Um, we are doing it according to um, our best um, tools. And um, for the classes where we cannot distance, which is the uh, classroom A, we have talked to those um, faculty members and we have implemented a rotation for the first couple of weeks of classes where every student cohort will have an opportunity to um, uh, flip the classroom and be remote every two weeks and we, we 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 intend for this to be temporary because everyone will be back in the in-person classes um because we have accommodated all the classroom with an in-person um protocol that we set up last year right thank you both very much i'd like to conclude where we started which was focusing again on the themes of kindness empathy and shared ownership and love and care for one another and I'd like to ask uh, uh, Ms. Burgos to please uh, conclude our webinar by talking about the kind of impacts uh, this is having on folks like yourself who are healthcare providers and how we can help those important colleagues like yourself and our important healthcare providers in our community that are working their tails off to try to keep our communities healthy and safe. Thank you, President Rolke. Um, yes, I do definitely want to encourage vaccination. Um, there is certainly exhaustion in the healthcare force. Uh, we are overwhelming our hospital system, our healthcare system. Um, I think that we really have to do our part. Uh, the only way to reduce transmission and to make space for others who may need surgery is like Dr. Johnson said, um, hard, you know, hard um, surgeries, anything like that it's to get vaccinated and do not overwhelm the healthcare system. Um, that's the only thing you can do for yourself. You can do it for your family, you can do it for the community, and also you can do it for your healthcare providers. Beautifully well, well said, and I thank you uh, for sharing that. I know that this has been, I'm sure, exhausting for you 
personally, and we are going to do the very best we can to rally around each other, again, to promote kindness, empathy, shared ownership, and love and care for one another. Thank you for joining us today. I know we did not get to all your questions. Please stay tuned for a forthcoming communication to the broader community, as well as an FAQ that will be forthcoming. And please keep your questions coming. Again, a reminder that we have vaccination clinics on campus. If you haven't gotten your vaccination, we're making it easy. College of Law, Thursday, August 12th, delay on campus, Wednesday, August 18th, and August 25th, and stay tuned for additional events. Thank you so very, very much. Kindness, empathy, shared ownership, love and care for one another. Go Hatters! <laughs>